Hello fellow Scratchers, I'm Griffpatch and welcome to episode 4 of my series on creating multiplayer cloud games in Scratch. Today's episode is entitled Automatic Game Joining and to achieve this we will split the job into four parts but don't worry all four are covered in this single episode. But just make sure you keep with me until the end where we should achieve something very satisfying indeed. If you missed parts 1-3 to three, then I'd advise you go back and complete these first as we're going to continue from where we left off. So stage one requires us to do some rather drastic script reshuffling, so try to follow carefully. Rather than staying with the single sprite approach, we are going to now draw a distinction between your player sprite and your opponent's sprites. The benefit of this is that the main player requires all the scripts for creating your game, whereas the opponents most likely only need to move around and change their costumes. Also, there are then no clones used in the player sprite, as there's just one for you, so coding the main player becomes easier to handle. Let's start by duplicating the player sprite and we'll name it Opponents. Click back to the first sprite and ensure it's named Player. We now want to remove anything that isn't to do with the main player scripts from this sprite. Where we used to have the setup players custom block, bring in a broadcast and wait for the message setup opponents. We'll move up the broadcast begin and delete the setup player's custom block altogether from this sprite. Under the begin receiver block stack, completely remove everything below the first if statement. This player sprite does not need to get its position from the cloud any longer. Let's change the if condition to be my player is greater than zero. This will allow our player sprite to send cloud data as whichever player number we get allocated. We wrap up the cloud writing scripts by creating a new custom block, send cloud data, run without screen refresh, and we'll move the setting coded block stack in there. This makes things tidier. Now drag the new custom block out and place it back inside the if statement. Now because this player sprite is only bothered with positioning our main player, we can simplify the positioning scripts to just use a go to mouse pointer block as the first block in our forever loop. From now on, we will be adding any player positioning code in there. This change also requires us to modify our send cloud data custom block to use X position and Y position in place of the mouse X and mouse Y blocks. We also need to switch the player hash variable here with my player hash. Now, let's switch over to the opponent sprite. We don't want to be triggering on the green flag any longer, but instead we will use the new when I receive setup opponents event. In fact, all we need in here is the setup player's custom block, so remove the rest. Let's drag in a set color effect to 90, so we can distinguish between the player sprite and all the opponent clone sprites. We could alternatively change the costumes themselves in the costume editor. Now that we have a player sprite, as well as the four opponent sprite clones, we will need to ensure we hide any opponent that is set to use the player ID that the player sprite is using. Within the begin receiver, replace the if with an if else block. When this opponent player has the same player ID as my player ID, set ghost to 100 to hide it. Otherwise, we do the decoding and positioning as before. Note that we can delete the encoding scripts from this opponent sprite now. Let's just tidy this up a little bit more by adding a new custom block called tick and move the decoding and positioning scripts in there. As always, then move the tick custom block to where the scripts were taken from. And now, let's test. I'll open up two windows side by side, and in the left window I press the 1 key. Now see how you can tell which player is me by the colour. At this point, did you notice that my player 1 sprite has been fading out while I'm not moving the mouse? Remember this, because we will come back to it shortly. But before we look into that, let's just tidy away some unused scripts. The player sprite no longer needs to be able to read or decode cloud data, so we can delete the following custom blocks. Value equals cloud hash player, and the begin decode of, and finally the value equals read from encoded blocks. And now let's move to the opponent sprite. We can remove anything to do with setting cloud variables. So delete the set cloud hash to value custom block, the write value to encoded, and while we're at it, 
all the when key pressed hat blocks to join the game, as these are also in the player sprite. OK, we've made it to stage two of this video where we're going to fix the fading out of non-moving players. To visualise what is happening here, let me make all the cloud variables visible. Now, when a player does not move their mouse, their position doesn't change, and therefore their cloud variable does not change either. This is leading to the player fading away on other players' screens, as if we were no longer playing. To fix this, we need to ensure that we are always changing our encoded cloud variable, even when we are not moving. Well, something that is always changing is the time. So how about we encode this to send along with our data? Within the player sprite, in the send cloud data custom block, we'll arrange it to first write the username, and then we'll write the round of timer times 10. Timer is in seconds, and cloud variables can only update 10 times a second. So if we multiply by 10 and then round it, then this number should increase by 1 every time the cloud variable is transmitted. Lastly, we write the x and y position as before. We're going to mirror these changes in the opponent sprite within the tick custom block after a begin decode. We first read from encoded the value of the player name. We therefore move the say block up here, then read in the time value. We don't do anything with this yet, so decode the next value, which is the x position, and then finally the y position. And now let's test again. Now, when I join the game with the one key and hold still, you will see that my player's cloud variable is constantly changing and the player no longer fades away. Great, let's move on. So we have this fading out effect, but the names of the offline players are still visible, which brings us to stage three of this tutorial. We're going to fix that and we're going to completely hide the player names too. In the opponent sprite, add a new variable named offline and make it for this sprite only. Under the setup players receiver, set offline to 100. This will signify the player is offline and hide the sprite. In the begin receiver, when my player equals player hash, set offline to 100 and hide. Now let's make a few changes to the tick custom block as follows. When the cloud variable has not changed, Rather than fading out, we now change the offline variable by 1. If the offline variable reaches 100, then we hide the entire sprite. This will also hide the name of the sprite in the speech bubble. Else, if the cloud variable has changed, then rather than removing the ghost effect, we now check whether offline is greater than 99. And if it was, then the sprite must have been hidden, and we show it again. Then after the if, still within the else block, we set offline back to zero to say that we are not offline. OK, let's give this a quick test. Notice as the project starts up, the offline players no longer fade out. But once they disappear, so do their usernames. Great, that's what we wanted to achieve. And now hold on to your scratch blocks because this is stage four and we are going to script the auto game joining code itself. The aim is to choose which player number we can be, and therefore which cloud variable we will use. How we are going to do this is when the project starts, we take a look at all the cloud variables, wait for a few seconds, and then we take another look. If a cloud variable has changed in that time, then someone is already playing using that variable. But if one of them is the same after that three seconds, well then, the game slot is most likely free to use, and we should claim it. Let's start by clicking into the stage backdrop to create some feedback messages for the user joining our game. First, rename the costume as blank. Now add a new backdrop named joining. Add a text message letting the player know we are trying to find them a place in the game. Next, add a costume named full. And this is to let them know that sadly the game is full. And finally, one more costume named joined. This is to say that we have successfully joined the game Right, back to the player sprite now, please. Under the setup opponents broadcast, add a switch backdrop to joining. Immediately after this, we will broadcast and wait a new message called join game. Next, add in an if else block and check for my player is greater than zero. This will be true if we have successfully joined the game. So set backdrop to joined. Otherwise, change the backdrop to full. 
while we're in the player sprite, we can remove all these when key pressed stacks, as I'm happy to say that we're not going to need them any longer. And let's also delete the unrequired player hash variable and last value variable too, as they are only used in the opponent sprite now. Lastly, click into the opponent sprite. Let's create that new receiver for join game. This will trigger on all the opponent clones when the game is starting. Drag in our custom block, value equals cloud hash, with an input of player hash. This gives us the current cloud variable for this opponent. Now, to keep a record of the value of this cloud variable, we set last value to the join of A and the variable value. We wait three seconds before then getting the cloud variable's value again, using the same custom block. Finally, compare the last value with the current value. If they are the same, then we can hope that this cloud variable is not in use by anyone else, and we set our my player hash to the player number of this opponent clone. As I said previously, this script is run for all the opponent clones as they all will share the join game script. Therefore, if any of them are not in use, then one of those will succeed in setting the my player. However, if we go back and look at the player sprite, you can see that if there were no free slots, then my player would have remained as zero, and we will get the message that the game is full. Right, time to test this out. First, I'll fire up the project in my two Scratch accounts. The one on the right is my main Griff Patch one, and the left is my Griff Patch Tutor. And you can see here that my Griff Patch account got in here with player one, and Griff Patch Tutor has been assigned player two. This is excellent. So how about a more thorough test? I'm going to ask some of my Scratcher friends to join. Who will join me first then? Ah, thank you, Lorenz P22. Great to have you on as player two. Oh yes, here is player three, Lega Bauer 9. This party is really getting going. And wow, cool, who is that? Uh, Luke Mania Studios grabbing the player four slot. We have success. We've maxed out all four player slots. If we wait around now, let's watch people leave. Now waiting for other players to join. Hello, Sergev412. And oh, nice to see you again, Crystal Keeper 7. And finally, Renz2. Brilliant. I think this has been a great success. So that's where we will leave this episode. We've made a lot of changes today, and I hope that you've been able to follow along. I can't wait to hear from you how you are doing. If you enjoyed this tutorial so far, then please like this video, subscribe to my channel, and I'll be back soon with another episode. Thank you for watching. Bye, guys.